Turn with me to James. I'm going to read chapter 1, uh, verses 1 to 4. James 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion, greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. I wonder, have you had the experience of ever having your eyes tested at the optician? Uh, I can see a number of us with glasses, so uh, the answer is a, a yes for many of you. Um, I've had this a number of times, and I just got a letter through the door the other day to say that I'm due another eye test. Um, when you are having your eyes tested in the opticians, you sit in a chair and they make you look at a poster of letters uh, of varying sizes. And uh, if things are blurry, then what they do is put this big thing in front of your eyes and they slot different lenses in and out to see, uh, uh, to, make, to help you see more clearly. And uh, they try to get the right lens in place. And when the right lens is in place, you can see more clearly. I think it was the great Reformation theologian John Calvin who said the Bible is like a pair of glasses, like lenses that enables us to see God and his world more clearly. The uh, sin has blinded us, blurred our vision, destroyed our vision. We cannot see the glory of God. We cannot see the beauty of the glory of God in his world. But the Bible is like our lenses that we look through so that we can see God and understand and see his world more clearly. In the opening verses of the book of James, it's like James is giving us a lens God is giving us a lens through his word to help us view rightly the various trials we experience in this life. When you read the first four verses of the book of James, it's like setting those lenses in place and you're to look through them to understand various trials we go through in life. Not just a way to understand trials, but actually the truth about trials that God reveals to us in his world, in his word. Essentially, verses two and three of chapter one answer, they answer a question for us. And the question is this, how are we to think biblically about the various trials we experience in this life? And I see at least three answers in these couple of verses and I want us to reflect on them this evening briefly. The three reasons um, or the three answers to that question, how are we to think about the various trials we experience in life, are these. Number one, we're not to be surprised by them. Number two, we're to see that there is a good purpose behind them. And number three, we're to rejoice in the good purpose that is being worked out in our trials and when we view our trials in this way it will be like a lens that helps us to see things clearly and may actually give us a sense of tenacious joy and hope in the midst of our trials so this is incredibly relevant for us because we are all passing through a, a trial now and so James is giving us a lens to help us look through so that we can rightly understand and view this trial in light of what God says in his word. So let's just start in at verse one and two. Uh, first of all, James begins by addressing his letter. You'll see uh, he says he's a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus, and he addresses it to the 12 tribes 
in the dispersion. Now, that's Old Testament language for the people of God. The 12 tribes, you're to think of Jacob's 12 sons, uh, the foundations of Old Testament Israel. And yet when James is speaking, uh, addressing his letter to the 12 tribes here, he's actually referring to the new covenant people of God. In a sense, the fulfillment, the filling in of Old Testament Israel, but now Jews, Gentiles, people from all nations forming the Israel of God, the people of God uh, in the new covenant. And he calls them the 12 tribes in the dispersion because the people of God at this time were scattered. They've been sent after persecution in Jerusalem all over the place. And so in many ways, this is very, very relevant and applicable to us. James is writing to a people who are scattered and who are isolated from one another. He's writing to people who are going through a time of real difficulty and vulnerability because of their scattering and isolation. And he writes to encourage and help them to know how to live wisely when you're going through such circumstances. A couple of years ago, I read for the first time Dickens's book, A Tale of Two Cities. And I was just thinking earlier that if James was to put a title on life, he would probably call life a tale of tests and trials. That is life. It is a story of different tests and trials we pass through on our journey home through this life if we are in Christ to God. And James tells us that we shouldn't really be surprised when we face tests and trials in this world. Notice in the second verse, he doesn't say count it all joy if you meet trials. He says, count it all joy when you meet trials of various kinds. This is life in a fallen world. It's a tale of tests and trials. So we shouldn't be surprised that all of our lives at different times are marked by difficulties. In 1 Peter 4.12, Peter put it like this. Don't be surprised at the fiery trials that come upon you to test you as though something strange were happening to you. James knows these trials that we experience in life can take many different forms. It's actually interesting. He uses this word uh, for various forms. Consider it all joy, my brothers, or my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds. There's one word behind that phrase, various kinds, and it's an interesting word. It can literally be translated um, many colors, uh, multicolored. Um, and so when James is saying, count it all joys, my bro- joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet trials of various kinds, he, he knows that our trials can take so many different shapes and sizes in this life. They can be big crises, or they can be very small things. Uh, they can be uh, the variety of trial that is like a, a sore toenail or something like that that's doing your head in to grief or to loneliness or to everything in between. James knows life in a fallen world is marked by tests and trials of many, many different kinds. This pandemic fits right into one of those various trials. James has in view. This pandemic is one of the marks of groaning in a fallen and cursed world. Our world is broken. We know because of the fall, because of sin and our rebellion against God, the world was plunged into fallenness. It doesn't always work the way it's supposed to. And so the first thing James does here is he just writes assuming Trials and tests are going to be a part of every one of our lives. But I suppose the question we need to ask then is, are we constantly to live in fear of the trials that are around the corner for us? Are we to see trials as just something we have to endure, something that doesn't don't really have meaning or value? We just just the reality of hard the hard life in a fallen world? Well, no, actually the second 
uh, way James answers the question. And that key question, remember, is how are we to think about the various trials we experience in this life? He doesn't just say we're not to be surprised by them. He says, secondly, we're to see that there's a good purpose behind them. So thinking now, very concrete, we're all going through isolation, we're all scattered from each other, we're all passing through a pandemic, and the lens James and God in his word wants to put in front of our eyes that we view this trial is to see there is a good design in it. God has a good purpose for his people in this. James explains that trials in this life are times when our faith is being tested. Do you see in verse 3 how he frames now his language for describing trials? For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. So straight away, James in one breath can say various trials. And then he says, that's the testing of your faith. Every time, every trial, some test of faith is involved in it. For you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. Here's how we're to view the challenges we're going through at the moment. This is a time of testing. It's an interesting way to think about it, isn't it? Our faith is being tested. You can think of Israel when they're sitting at the foot of Mount Sinai in Exodus 19 and 20. Moses goes up, receives the law, but then he tarries for a long time. And after the law has been given and we read the whole narrative of identity formation of the people of God, Moses doesn't come back down. They're waiting and they're waiting and they're waiting. They're being tested, but they fail the test. They say, right, this Moses, we don't even know what's happened to him. Up, let's make ourselves gods. And they melt down their gold, they make their golden calf, and they sacrifice to it. They failed the waiting test. And in a sense, we're going through a time of waiting, we're going through a trial. This is a way that God is actually testing our faith. And the question is, will we get restless like Israel and say, right, God clearly doesn't know what he's doing, so let's just give up our faith? Will we, will we push God to the side? Will we reject God? Or in the midst of our affliction, will we lean into God and hope in him all the more? Again, Peter in 1 Peter 1, 6 and 7 says that trials are to test the genuineness of our faith, like gold being refined in a fire. The testing actually refines our faith and James here tells us it produces something in us. This stretching, this testing actually produces steadfastness in us. It's like the testing of our faith works out our faith muscles and makes them stronger. Gives us uh, stamina. It makes our faith more sure and steadfast so that in the future we trust we won't be just as easily blown around. Our fluctuating ups and downs will become less extreme, or at least that's what we hope. This testing and cultivation of steadfastness, we're told then, brings greater spiritual roundedness to our lives and maturity. So in verse 4, we read, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So God's purpose in our trials is to test, stretch, refine our faith, to sanctify us, to make us stronger, to make us more mature, and to make us more rounded as Christians. And so this brings me to the third answer to our question. And remember, our question is, how are we to think about the various trials we experience in this life? Well, one, we're not to be surprised by them. Two, we're to see there's a good purpose in them. And then three, we're to rejoice in the good purpose that's being worked out in our trials. Verse two, count it all joy. There is so much in that little two-letter word, it. Count it all joy. That it 
stands for all the trials, all the hardships, all the tests, all the ups, all the downs, count it, all joy. Now that's not, we must be careful not to misunderstand this, that is not some fake superficial joy, some fake smile we're to put on as if we're happy that we're going through hardship. No, this is something deep inside that speaks to us in our affliction. And that deep word that speaks to us in our affliction is simply this. This is not meaningless. This pain, this affliction, this hardship, this is not just the impersonal forces of fate doing a job on me. The, the, the deep place, the truth speaks to us in our affliction. So even in the heart but that the ache, the only hope we might have is that God is with us. He's still sovereign. And this is not meaningless. This is not a waste. The pain I'm experiencing, it's not just pain for pain's sake. No, God is actually doing something good in me through this. Now, you might never feel it or experience it or know it right in the moment. And you shouldn't be afraid of that. But there's something deep that holds us when we look back and we start to say, okay, I have to choose to trust in this, that there is a design in this, that it is going to mature and sanctify me and God's at work to make me more like Christ. And therefore, in some way, I'm going to try to choose the place of contentment Peace, rest, joy. I'm going to try to choose to put my faith there in that God is working something good through this. And James says, that's how we're to view. That's the lens we're to put in front of our eyes so that we can see clearly to understand what God is doing in our afflictions. And so again, when you put that lens, that biblical lens in place and you view this pandemic, and all the isolation, and all the different things we're going through at the moment. We are not to be surprised that we're experiencing difficult things in a fallen and broken world. We're not, as Christians, immune to it. However, we have an incredible hope, because where for the world, there really is no design. This is just terrible. There's not really any hope. It's just get rid of it, get rid of it, get rid of it. We actually know that in each of our lives, individually and corporately as a church, God has a purpose here. And his purpose is to make us stronger, to produce more steadfastness in us, to sanctify us, to make us, these are the words, perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. That's what God's doing in each of your lives right now. So all the isolation, all the anxiety, all the angst you're feeling, all the stuff you're going through, God is actually designing something in it so that he is making you stronger and making you more rounded and mature as a Christian. And so we're to focus on that and in some way count it joy. Say, yes, Lord, this is really hard. I don't really feel it. I don't really feel the joy, but I'm going to count it joy. And remember, that is the language used. Count it joy. It doesn't mean you have to feel super happy about it, but you're choosing to count it joy. I'm deciding to put my faith there right now, not joy in the loneliness, not joy in the isolation, not joy in being apart from each other and not able to gather corporately. I'm going to count it joy, though, that this is not meaningless and that God is at work in my life right now to make me more mature as a Christian. And I'm going to count that joy. And I'll be honest with you, I'm having to preach that to myself at the moment and preach it to myself again and preach it to myself again. Each morning at the moment, I seem to be waking up with a weight on me and I am preaching to myself, Lord, restore to me the joy of your salvation today. Help me to reframe this day and to remember that once I was destined for hell, 
but you've saved me and I'm, my sin is gone and I'm righteous in Christ today and help me to rejoice in all the good work you're doing to make me more like Jesus. And you frame every day through the lens of the truth of God's word, not through all the stuff that's coming at you in the news and the media all the time. Keep framing your life with the truth of the word. That's what it is to be renewed in your mind day by day. Let the truth govern your experience. Don't let your experience govern your understanding of the truth. And so we are called to view our trials in this way, to understand this is a time of testing for us that is good for us. But we must make sure that we don't fail the test. Israel failed the test at Sinai. They didn't wait. They grew impatient. They grumbled. They turned to idols. I'm telling you at the moment, if there's one thing that I'm learning in this trial, it's am I really satisfied in God alone? Is God really my joy? Because when all the entertainment of going out is taken away, and even the things like going out for coffees, restaurants, <clears throat> going out to play rugby with friends or take Hudson and Elliot out to rugby, when all that's stripped away and I'm feeling quite low, where is my true joy found? And so I guess for each of us, it's turning again like the psalmist saying, Lord, for you alone, for God alone, I wait in silence. My salvation is from him. He's the fount of all our joy, all our peace, all our happiness. And I think in many ways, this time of being stripped back is really pushing us to ask again, where is our joy to be found? And so let's keep wrestling, fighting, doing all we can to keep fighting for joy in the Lord and to find in him that joy, peace, knowing that he's at work in our lives. So let's choose to count it joy. I know that's not easy, but again, remember, not based on feelings, the decision of faith in light of the truth to count it joy. So let's pray as we just uh, finish up there. Um, and let's just pray that the Lord would help us with this. Father, we do ask that you would help us. This is both a wonderful, profound, glorious truth, but boy, it's hard for us to practice this uh, when we're in the eye of the storm. And so, Lord, we thank you that um, you give us this lens, the truth of your word to help us look at our trials. And though we may not feel very joyful in the midst of difficulties, we can choose to count it joy, a tenacious, determined joy, not because we're going through affliction or because we're weighed down, but instead because we know there's purpose, meaning, you're working, you're sanctifying, you're building, you're doing things in us so that none of this is meaningless. And so we hope there, Lord. And we thank you, Lord, that we have that incredible hope that there is meaning in all the different things we go through in this life and that we are not uh, at the mercy of the impersonal forces of fate, but instead we are in the hands of a sovereign good God who is always at work for our good in Christ. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.